Well, good evening, everyone. My name is Charlene Margo, and I am co-founder of Nonprofit The Parent Venture that brings you this program, The Parent Education Series. We are so delighted to have with us tonight, Sarah Stein Greenberg, Executive Director from Stanford's D School. We'll be telling you a little bit more about her. So tonight, this event is sponsored with generous donors from Mills Peninsula Hospital Foundation and the San Mateo County Office of Education, along with this organization, The Parent Venture. We are going to be talking about Sarah's new book, Creative Acts for Curious People, how to think, create, and lead in innovative ways. And we are so excited to have her with us. Stanford is an important part of our program, both for me personally, and because the D School has done so much to really inspire educators. And tonight, we hope to inspire you, the parents, educators, and community members who are in the room with us. By now, most of you are familiar with Zoom and the webinar format, but just to refresh, there's two ways for you to interact with us. There is the chat box or chat button. My co-founder, Bev Hartman, will be putting resource links there in chat, so do check that out. And also, if you want to communicate questions, not questions about the program, but operational things to us, you can do that in chat. But we ask that you put your questions, again, for Sarah in the Q&A box. So um, comments to us and each other in the chat, and then questions for the program in the Q&A. Tonight's event is being video recorded and will be available soon on our free video library YouTube channel. Bev will be putting a link to the video library in the chat. We hope that you will check that out. We've had more than 50,000 views and have close to 180 presentations on the video library to date. Um, I think that's it for now. Let me tell you a little bit about tonight's featured presenter. Sarah Stein Greenberg is the executive director of the Stanford D School. She leads a community of designers, faculty, and other innovative thinkers who help people unlock their creative abilities and apply them to the world. Sarah speaks regularly at universities and global conferences on design, business, and education. She holds an MBA from the Stanford Graduate School of Business and a BA in history from Oberlin College. Sarah also serves as a trustee for RARE, a global conservation organization. Among other creative pursuits, she spends her free time as an underwater and wildlife photographer. She lives in San Francisco. Please join me in a really warm, warm virtual welcome for tonight's presenter, Sarah Stein Greenberg. I will say also, sorry, did not mention, Sarah will be speaking for about 25 minutes about her new book, Creative Acts for Curious People. And then we're gonna open it up to questions from the audience. So please do put your questions in the Q&A box. Take it away, Sarah. All right, Charlene, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much to Cynthia for the translation and for this whole community. It's wonderful to be with you this evening. Um, as Charlene said, I'm just going to speak a little bit about um, the D School and how we think about design. People have lots of different ways of thinking about like, what is design? What is design good for? And I want to let you in on how we think about it. Um, and then I'm going to tell you a couple of stories that I hope will, will really help you um, identify with the ways in which we think that design strategies and methods can really help unlock all kinds of creative thinking um, and, and how important that is in this particular moment that we're in. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and uh, we will get going. All right. So uh, let me just start by, you know, stating something that it, it's almost so obvious, I don't know if I need to say it, but I, I want to just set some context, right, which is that thinking and creating and leading and decision making, they look really different in a world of great uncertainty. And that is the world that we are living in today. So, you know, for the past two years, we have had uh, a real object lesson in uncertainty. You know, every single one of us has been called upon to react quickly, to find our way, to come up with new strategies for, um, you know, things that we're dealing with at work or in our families, um, how we're dealing with school in new ways, um, whether we're on the educator side or the, or the parent side. And you know, this time has really stretched all of us and we have had to adapt. And one of the pieces of research that I saw quite early on um, as, as organizations and, and society as a whole was really making this transition to this you know, new world of unknowns um, was the following. This was a study that came uh, from McKinsey um, looking at what are the leadership skills that were helping organizations the most 
after the pandemic began. And, you know, although this is focused on organizational leadership, this is true for schools, this is true for communities. These are the kinds of things on the right hand side, you'll see this list that were actually rising in importance after the pandemic started. So right at the top, you see things like being supportive and caring and being employee focused, um, being creative and entrepreneurial, embracing rapid decision making, and, and right under that, being comfortable with ambiguity, which as you'll hear in a second is um, a topic that we're gonna spend a little bit more time on because it, it, it is so important. And I think I was really grabbed by this, this uh, research for a couple of reasons. So I, for one part of it, you know, these are not necessarily the skills or the attributes that I think we always associate with leaders right? It's, it's particularly executive leadership, right? There are some other, you know, having a vision, being able to execute, being able to delegate. Um, and, and it was really striking to me that so many of these feel more human, feel more connected. Um, and then really thinking about what are the ways in which we take in information and we make decisions when we are in a world of unknowns, right? And, and just seeing this data, I think, was really um, fascinating, That like how different this list feels. And then the other reason that this really resonated with me um, is because these are many of the values that we strive to embed in our, in our learning experiences that are around design. So not necessarily explicitly around leadership, but around you know, how we're helping our students and the professional learners who come and, and work with us um, to really embody the, these kinds of strategies all the time. So when I think about like, what would this chart look like in a photo? This is the photo that always springs to my mind. And this is a group of just incredibly amazing leaders. They are all leaders of social sector organizations. So they work in government agencies or they lead nonprofits. Um, this is a global group. And um, the, the, the group is gathered here. This was, as you can tell from just like the proximity that everyone is into each other. This is a pre-pandemic workshop. And it said that it was taken at the end of a really long and intensive week of very hard work. This was a group of people who had like just been through this um, learning experience where they were working on a real project. They were working on teams with people they had never met before. And they were navigating their way through a kind of, um, you know, uh, like open-ended, really challenging problem space. And yet you see this like incredible collaborative spirit and this energy and, and maybe a little relief um, at, at having been through this, this experience together. Um, so, so this is part of what the D School does, right? We have a, a program that is focused on Stanford students. Um, and we teach classes for students who are coming from all across the university, which means that we get to have a really interdisciplinary mixture of students in any given class. Um, but we also offer learning experiences for professionals, including these folks from the social sector, but also folks in K-12 and in higher education um, and also the private sector. And um, I want you to hear a little bit uh, from one of the people who went through this program. Um, so you can hear why design right? Like what is design going to offer folks who are in these kinds of complex roles um, that maybe would be additive to their already formidable skills? So this is a man named Lejean Lincoln who um, participated in this program, as I said, and Lejean is the head of young people and community services uh, with an organization called Peabody Housing Association. And Peabody is uh, the largest and the oldest provider of affordable housing in the UK. Um, and so Lejean deals with challenges um, that, you know, range from, uh, you know, issues of uh, kids who are having a hard time finishing their education, unemployment or underemployment, um, substance abuse or mental health issues. You know, all of these are challenges that don't have easy right answers. There's no one right answer. People have been working on them for a long period of time. And we asked Lejean to talk about, you know, in this highly ambiguous um, kind of problem space uh, and set of things that he is he is concerned with, like why design? What's, what is it about design that's helping him? So here uh, directly from Lejean on this topic. If anyone knew what was going on, or how to solve things, we would have cracked it, and they were, therefore we wouldn't have all these social problems, right? So it kind of stands to reason that whatever's happened before hasn't really worked, or not, or not, or not in a way to really resolve and stop certain things. So at least thinking about design, using design, applying design, at the very least, it gives you hope. 
But at the same time, it gives you a really structured and creative way to continue that journey and knowing that there might not be an end point. You might not reach a point where you've cracked it, but you've got a really structured way to continue to know that well, I'm keeping going. Like I've gone here and I've achieved this, but I'm not stopping there. I've achieved an iteration or a piece of work and I'm going to learn from that and then go into the next step and then go into the next step, you know? So that's why, why design. It's not about having the answer or sort of coming to an end point. It's about, I don't know the answer, but I'm going to keep going and keep going. I've got that hope and excitement and it will always improve. So let me just echo what Lejean ended with. He said, it's not about having the answer or coming to the end point. I don't know the answer, but I've got that hope and excitement and can always improve. And I think what is so striking about that is it is a profound mindset shift from the idea that as experts or as leaders um, or, or as the heads of our households, we have to have the right answer all the time, or we have to have an answer. And instead really foregrounds the idea that design can be a, a process where you aren't coming to an end point, but you are getting to really meaningful milestones and you are continuing to improve. That you, you have a process to draw on that helps you navigate that challenging problem space that you're in. Um, and, and it gives you some hope. So let's dive into like really what this looks like in practice. At the D School, we often talk about design as a relationship between problem solving and problem finding. And problem solving is, you know, no matter what kind of educational background you have, you have been trained in problem solving. It, that is like a very common way that we think about what all different kinds of uh, education or disciplines or fields are, are good at. Um, and, you know, human beings are kind of natural problem solvers. So that makes a lot of sense. But problem finding is something that we really specialize and emphasize in design. And it really is about making sure that you have gone back and challenged the way the problem that you might have been handed is being framed, or that you challenge some of the conventional wisdom, and that you stay in this space of gathering data and exploring and trying to make new connections, maybe for longer than you feel is comfortable. So when you're in a problem finding mode, you are doing things like learning from others and interviewing and observing and understanding the context and the history. Um, you are trying to find patterns in all the information that you're gathering and maybe find some novel ways to connect the dots and see some new patterns that others are missing. And then you are really trying to step back and say, okay, given what I know, what's the real problem to be solved here, right? Like what, how are we gonna reframe it in a way that actually could lead us down a novel path and a really innovative um, direction. And then when you're problem solving in design, you're rapidly experimenting, you're making models and prototypes and you're testing them and you're getting feedback in an iterative way. And you're communicating, you know, what is the vision that I have about what this world might look like with my solution in it. Um, and you're, you're doing that in ways that are very, very intentional um, to get you better information and, and ask new questions in many cases. And when we teach in, at the D School, we, instead of handing people a, a problem to be solved, we say, hey, you know, we think the problem maybe, or there's an opportunity maybe, or there's a set of needs over here, but please go investigate those. Get some primary data, make up your own mind, and you frame the problem that you think is worth working on here. And because we're having people kind of back up into problem finding, whereas we're hardwired to problem solve, we're actually giving students a really practical way to understand how do I navigate ambiguity, right? Ambiguity is that state of, you know, well, we, there are multiple directions we could pursue here, right? There are multiple needs. How do we balance those? We've got lots of ideas. Which ones are the best ideas? Multiple things could emerge from, from the work that you're doing. And this is a state of being that actually human beings are pretty uncomfortable with. So oftentimes when we're problem, when we're working on something, we um, do something called we rush to closure, right? We actually try to avoid the messiness of that ambiguous state. And through design, what we see is that people can start to get a higher tolerance for working in this iterative way that then really allows you to tackle challenges that don't have clear, easy, right answers, um, like Lejean was saying. So I want to share this story um, to really bring this process to life. 
Um, this is a story uh, about an amazing entrepreneur named Jill Violet. Many of you in this community may be aware of her work because um, she is a serial kind of education entrepreneur. Um, and Jill uh, is best known for founding an organization called Playworks. Um, Playworks, if you uh, aren't familiar with it, provides um, trained coaches who staff recess in schools. And there are so many benefits of having a really well-run recess. Um, one is like the, the classroom educators don't have to take on that extra responsibility, but there's also lots of um, social and emotional benefits for kids around structured play, um, conflict resolution. So there, there are all kinds of good reasons um, um, for schools to uh, work with Playworks and, and use their coaches. And Jill describes what happened next as a certain problem following her around. And what she means by that is that over many years of running Playworks, she kept having this experience where she would hear from principals, you know, I we had a teacher who couldn't come today. It was last minute. We couldn't get a sub. Can we borrow one of your coaches to be a sub? And she heard this enough times that she was like, well, oh, there's something interesting here, right? Like, I don't exactly know what the issue is, but I'm now I'm curious because I've heard this need come up so many different times. So Jill embarked on a year long fellowship at the D school to really investigate and, and, and figure out like, well, what, what could I design? What could I launch um, in this space? So a few notes about uh, substitute teaching um, that Jill's research un uncovered. So for one thing, at any given moment, 10% of teachers in US classrooms are subs. And so this means that over a kid's experience between kindergarten and 12th grade, they will have about a year of instructional time with substitutes. So there's a, a, a sizable impact that either a really you know, good system for getting subs will have or, or a not great system um, could have. And then secondly, the average coverage rate um, when subs are requested is only 80%. And during the pandemic, I should say that data is from before the pandemic, during the pandemic in many places that, that rate was closer to 50%. Um, and it's also unevenly distributed across school districts. So there are, you know, a significant gap in, in the subs that are available to fill the classroom need. And then finally, um, Jill started to dig into like, well, what kind of training and preparation is happening for subs? And found out that actually there are a significant number of districts that are either doing very little training or no training for substitute teachers. So you can imagine all of the challenges that would ensue. Now you can look at this data and start to form an opinion about like, well, what would you do to try to address some of these problems or some of these gaps? Um, and what we had Jill do along with her teammate, Amanda Von Moose, was really go back into that problem framing space. So she started um, by conducting a whole range of interviews with people who really had primary experience around substitute teaching. So they they talked to subs, they talked to people who had been long-term subs, people who had um, tried it and not liked it. They talked to students, they talked to family members, they talked to former principals, um, and they really started to get a more well-rounded understanding and, and hear really more human stories about this, about this challenge. So, um, you know, one, one sub that they talked to said, you know, like I, I was never trained. So I showed up in the classroom, you know, on my very first day and I just didn't have any tools. I didn't know what to expect and I didn't know how to handle the classroom. Um, and they heard other stories like, you know, I, I didn't know where to park. And so I parked and I worked hard all day and I thought I was, you know, doing a good job. And then I, I get back to my car and there's a parking ticket. She was like, it just really ruined the whole experience. So all kinds of different levels around um, of information started coming out about like our subs being welcomed in a in an organized way. Do they know what the classroom plan is? Um, lots of really interesting texture. So Jill and Amanda started coming up with ideas about what they might do. And they really, they couldn't get that, you know, the main gap out of their mind. So they started thinking about like, well, we know there, there are places where schools just really don't have enough subs. So like, let's work on that recruitment problem. And they framed the problem as how might we get more subs to go to schools that struggle to attract and retain enough of them. And they came up with a bunch of different ideas. Um, they came up with a flyer they could post in restaurants, a video that could highlight the wonderful attributes of their, that local school, um, promoting the opportunity on social media, which hadn't been tried um, in that area. 
And these were actually not just ideas. These were all prototypes that Jill and Amanda actually tried. So they made all of these and every single one totally flopped. Not a single substitute teacher was recruited or signed up as a result of these efforts. And so they, you know, slightly wounded pride. Um, they, they went back to the drawing board and they realized like, okay, th that, th this experience is telling us something like we haven't quite framed the problem right. So they went back and they did a whole bunch of more interviews and they realized like, well, maybe we should focus on the fact that in some schools they're getting subs, but then those subs have a bad experience and then they don't come back. So maybe we should reframe this problem, not as much around recruitment, but around retention. So they came up with additional insights, right? They, they really honed in on this issue that subs are not getting information that they need in order to be successful. They realized from observation, like, wow, they are asking for help at the busiest time in the morning, right? Like right when everything is happening and it's really chaotic in the office. And, you know, understandably, they get really frustrated when they can't get help. And that is leading to this retention issue. So they, they kept working on this problem framing and they realized like, let's just zero in on that information challenge. There is an information gap here. And they realized like, the person everybody is trying to get help from is the office manager who is scrambling. Like that person is a key part of this system. And we hadn't really identified that as, as being so important. And then I started thinking about like, you know, there's gotta be a way to actually add a little bit of technology into this situation that could just help streamline this process. So from there, they came up with a new idea, um, which they called sub plans. And sub plans was just this concept that was like, let's make it easier for teachers to make plans and an easier way to ensure that those plans actually get into the hands of the office manager who gets them into the hands of the sub. So they built this idea into um, like a really just kind of quick rough and ready format. They, I think they use Google slides and they got some initial feedback. And then they happen to be presenting um, and, and going to a, uh, an ed tech conference. So now they have an opportunity to just get dozens and dozens of people to give them feedback on what is still a pretty rough concept at this point. But what was interesting is that at this conference, they talked to principals, they talked to technologists, they talked to teachers, and they started realizing like, oh, the feedback that we're getting is like little tweaks about how to make it better. And in fact, they had two principals say, oh, is this available now? Like we would try this out. And so they realized like, okay, that's some data that says now we, we've been through enough iterations, we're kind of on the right track. So they partnered with a school who agreed to pilot this idea for a full year. And that enabled them to get lots more feedback and see what was working and what wasn't. And sub plans really turned out to be a very simple offering. It is basically a, an online platform where a teacher can upload their plans the night before or as soon as they know that they need to be covered. And the platform generates a PDF, super standard. And that then means that the office manager can just print this like ready to print document in the morning at that busy time and hand it directly to the sub. And Jill in reflecting on this says, you know, sometimes we feel self-conscious holding up a simple tool like subplans as an example of innovation. But it's really reaffirmed our commitment to use design. It's the first thing we've made that people actually want. And it's a reminder that the best designs come from listening to people as opposed to focusing exclusively on high level strategy. And Jill and Amanda wrote this brilliant short book that I highly recommend that really details this whole story. Um, and it both goes into lots of practical ways to apply design, as well as like all of their findings about substitute teaching and a whole bunch of other ideas that they're trying and prototyping as well around training and around recruitment. And I'll finish that story by just sharing um, from the forward of that book, something that Susie Wise said, who is the founder of our K-12 work at the D School. She said, substantial demonstrates how the design framework offers a powerful model for reimagining aspects of our educational system that is both innovative and respectful, and that the people in our educational communities, teachers, administrators, students, and families are already in possession of the solutions we need. I think that is a very powerful way to think about what is innovation, right? It is about listening to people. It is about being respect. It is about being creative. 
but it is not about a sort of like top-down strategy-led approach. It's really about this, this bottoms-up process that is iterative, that, as Lejean said, gives you hope and excitement that you can always improve. So this example, uh, the work that Jill and Amanda did, and many, many others that have come out of the students and the fellows um, working at the D School and studying at the D School, is really why I sat down over the past few years and put this book together. So, you know, we are all facing these kinds of challenges that require fresh thinking, that require a new way to, to notice what's going on in our environment, and also things keep changing. So it's not about kind of getting expertise to deal with the current moment. It's about having a process that you can keep on using to learn and to change and to adapt um, as the context shifts. And in this book is really um, just a wealth of ideas and methods and skills that come directly from the D-Schools teaching community. So it's, it's important to know, I, I put this book together with a lot of help, but it really reflects the contributions of over a hundred faculty and instructors um, and alums as well uh, from the D-School. So there are 81 different assignments um, that we teach uh, in various classes that are, that are embedded in this book. And they have a huge range in terms of their, their content and their topic and the types of creative work that they might help you unlock. So I'll give you just two examples. Um, these are both examples that might help you um, think about like, how do I start to, I, I'm, I'm frustrated, I'm tired, I've been working on this challenge for a long time. How can I try to see this like through new eyes? So the first assignment that you see on the left there is called the Derive. Um, and this was contributed by our amazing um, uh, academic director, Carissa Carter. Um, and it is a process of um, taking a walk that you, instead of planning your walk, you actually let yourself be guided by what you notice. So you will choose a quality, perhaps the color yellow, or perhaps you'll choose to follow smells or sounds. And you, you walk up to the first thing that you see um, at the start of your walk that has that quality and you investigate it and maybe you draw a little sketch. And then you find the next thing that you can see around you that, that has that same quality and you continue the walk in that way. And what's very interesting is that this exercise is very powerful in helping people get unstuck. It has kind of a meditative and flow quality to it because you start to, you're, you're filtering out sort of the traditional things that you're noticing and you're honing in on these very specific details. Um, I regularly hear from people who say like, oh, I did a derive around my neighborhood and I saw things in my neighborhood that I've lived in for decades that I have never noticed before. Um, and then I also will hear feedback about how this practice has helped people like unravel a really thorny challenge that has been kind of like, they've been really stuck on and somehow this process of focus and noticing and learning how to um, really tune your attention in this very specific way has helped them kind of like make a connection that helps them un get unstuck and move forward. The second assignment um, that will just give you kind of a, a sense of the, the range um, of, of methods that are in here is called Identify, Acknowledge, Challenge. And this comes from um, one of our, another one of our former fellows, a guy named Chris Rudd, who um, runs a social impact design firm in Chicago called Chai by Design. And um, Chris's work focuses a lot on anti-racism um, and other uh, equity um, oriented projects. And he um, developed this with his students actually, because um, he's now also a, a teacher of design. And so this is a process of really thinking about who you are serving and thinking about the fact that in our design work, it is very easy for all kinds of biases and stereotypes that we are unconsciously carrying around to seep into that work and into our offerings, our, whether again, you know, whether we're an educator or we're an administrator or in healthcare, like what we design affects people differently based on who they are and based on who we like think that, that they might be. So this is a really amazing and quite deep uh, method to unpack some of those stereotypes and connect the dots between how those may be unconsciously showing up in your design work and how you can really start to um, address and to challenge those stereotypes and make sure that the things that you are creating work well for all of your students or all of your uh, patients or whoever it is that you're uh, trying to serve. 
So these are just two of the 81, um, as I mentioned. And um, we can talk about uh, you know, the, sort of the broader range, but there are um, assignments that are around um, starting a new collaboration, around, again, noticing, around sketching and uh, using visual communication in new ways, around how to build your ideas into rough prototypes, um, and even how to think about what are the potential long-term impacts of the designs that you're creating and the solutions that you're putting into the world. So many, many, many ways to engage uh, in design work um, through, through this book. I also wanted to highlight, um, because I think this audience, uh, you'll, you'll be interested um, in knowing more about this next set of books that we're about to release. Um, but we have a whole series of books that are coming from many different authors within the D School, and we're, we're so close to launch date. So I just wanna take the opportunity to share those very briefly. Um, so one of them is um, Design for Belonging, which is written by Susie Wise, who I mentioned um, as, as a key to our K-12 efforts over the years. Um, and this really focuses on, you know, we, we often have real aspirations and really good intentions around working on inclusion and working to make sure that um, our, our organizations and our communities are welcoming to everyone. But we also need some like really practical tools for how to take action on that, um, on those values and on that aspiration. And those tools are in this book. Um, this is uh, work that Susie has been doing uh, for many years now. We also have a book coming out um, that is about how to tell stories with data. Um, we are so overwhelmed these days by all of the data that is available um, and data can be used in ways that are you know, really informative, but also can, can really um, be skewed, can be biased. And so this is a whole book about how to really be thinking um, about how to tell stories with that data. Um, also, a murder mystery is embedded um, in which you have to pull the data out in order to uh, solve that mystery. Um, the third one is called Drawing on Courage. And this comes from um, an amazing uh, former fellow and instructor named Ashish Goel. Um, and Ashish is a professional designer. Um, and he really realized that, you know, as good as his training was and his skills were, he also sometimes had trouble navigating his, his company, um, getting his ideas out. Um, knowing how to kind of take a stand when it was um, worth doing so. And so he talks about, you know, a lot of the courage that we need to exhibit um, in, our, in our community work, in our creative work in general, um, you know, it's not epic courage. It's not like going on a big quest. It's like everyday courage and how you act on your values every day is a form of courage. Um, and this is uh, part uh, comic and part regular book. And then the last one, um, because it ties in so nicely with some of the themes uh, that I was talking about earlier, is a book that is all about navigating ambiguity. Um, and this really comes from work that we have been doing for many years now at the D School to foreground how essential it is that we actually develop deeper skills and really think about ambiguity, not just as something to fear or to be, um, you know, try to get through as quickly as possible, um, but actually that, you know, when there's ambiguity, there is also so opportunity, right? It means we just don't know what the future holds. It means that multiple things are possible. And that's the way we want to think about it as designers and um, in any kind of creative um, process is that ambiguity really um, is, is a source of opportunity and innovation. So I'm going to close um, my formal talk there. And I'm really looking forward uh, to the questions that we're going to get into with Charlene and then to hearing from all of you. Well, thank you so much, Sarah. That was just inspiring. And I think whether or not you are familiar with design thinking or not, you really brought us all along. We appreciate that. That was just really wonderful. So I have a few questions for you before we open it up to the audience. And I promise everybody, please do put your questions in the Q&A box. We've already got a couple of great questions coming in. So Sarah, I like to start by the question that I ask every author, and that is, what motivated you to write this book? Why did you feel that this book needed to be? It's such a good question. You know, I, I'll say a couple of things. One is like, I just fundamentally believe everyone is creative. And, you know, in the same way that Ashish is really interested in kind of everyday courage, I am really interested in everyday creativity and everyday innovation. And I think we just have this terribly pervasive myth in our society that like innovation looks like really shiny, fancy new tech or creativity looks like, you know, paintings that are in the MoMA. And I, I just think there is so much creativity that is possible, but many people 
are um, not necessarily seeing themselves as creatives or creative, you know, creatively uh, endowed. And so, you know, that's, that's mission one, right, is to get, is to really try to break down that myth and to give people those practical tools that might help unlock some of that, um, some of that ability that is inherent. And then the second piece is that there's just, there's so, uh, you know, as you heard me say, like, I'd love to brag about my colleagues. There is so many amazing ideas and classes and methods that have been taught and developed at the D School over the years. And actually a very small percentage of that has ever kind of made its way out into the, into the public domain. So that's what this whole publishing effort is about is like, we just really want to make these ideas more accessible to more people. That is really wonderful. One of the things that we try to do is reach academics with wonderful messages. People like Kendall Bronk, whose research is around finding purpose, but it so seldom gets translated to the family, parent, and community level. So thank you for that. And you, I guess you really answered it because my next question was, so many people say, you know, I'm curious, but I'm just not creative. And you say what to those people? I say, well, I usually ask them to like, tell me a story of the last time they had to solve a tricky problem or they were faced with kind of a new situation. And then you like actually hear all these great examples of creativity. And I, I will give you one that just came up um, last week. I was giving a talk and someone who is in finance asked me a question about the ways in which she has to do forecasting. And, um, and she, she works in an educational company. Um, it, was a, it was a really interesting question. And she was sort of framing it of like, how could I possibly use these methods? You know, could, could, I, could I, you know, is there some way to be creative about how we're doing this? And we got into a great conversation. And, and from the start, I just knew she was already thinking in a really creative way because she was asking that question, right? She could sense that the ways in which the company was, was thinking about this, this project that she was on were, were more conventional and were going to limit the, the potential of where they were going. So I, I think there's just like always so many examples, but sometimes you need that reflected back at you. Um, in order to see it for yourself. And I'm assuming that's probably something that you encounter with your students at the D school. You know, many of those kids have been going to school and high achievers and good grades and all that stuff. And all of a sudden they've got to break out of that a little bit. Yeah. I mean, you have really put your finger on kind of what we see and, you know, particularly in a place uh, like Stanford, where our students are so so smart and also so good at thriving in very structured environments, mm -hmm. right? They have really gotten good at jumping through all of those hoops that have helped them land at Stanford. Um, but the challenges that they're gonna face when they graduate are not structured. They are not predictable. They are going to have many, many different types of careers over not just jobs, but different careers over the courses of their lives for things we can't even, we don't have names for yet. And so this is a generation of students that will have to figure out how to be resilient, how to be adaptive, and how to work in an iterative way when there is so much ambiguity and uncertainty. So I think of that often as like the gap between the kind of the, the way they're coming in, you know, very structured and they're graduating into a world that is anything but. And so how do we actually help them in the time that we have with them kind of cross that, you know, make that leap to thinkers who can, I mean, already draw on all of their amazing talents and strengths, but also add this ability to work in this, in this new way. That is so interesting. And I think that you really hit on this, that uncertainty and ambiguity make everyone nervous. Right. And if we can convince people that there's ways to handle it, as you say, in an inter iterative way and use this process, it's so helpful. So, Sarah, speaking of which, this is top of mind for everyone who works with kids in schools. How can design help with developing resilience? How does that specifically impact it? I know you've touched on this. Yeah. So, you know, one of my favorite concepts that I have just completely borrowed from mathematics educators is around productive struggle, right? So if you're a math educator in this group, or you're a, a parent who's really into understanding um, math education, you might already know about this. Um, but productive struggle is the, is the reality that, you know, when kids learn um, and they struggle at first, they don't quickly get the right answer. It, the, the learning is actually likely to um, be retained longer and more transferable. Um, and this is particularly true in math. And I think it's also being studied in other disciplines as well um, on other subjects. So, um, you know, that feeling of discomfort that you're having when you're not getting something right, right away 
is really productive. But as you said, like it makes us really uneasy. It makes us feel like we're behind, right? It's, it's, it's easier in most of our environments to like get the, you know, be that person who gets the right answer quickly. So having this practical experience in a design class where you're thrown a challenge that, that like, you know, unlike most of the um, tests or problem sets that students are given, the faculty in our classes, we don't know the answer. Right, because it's going to it's going to happen when the students actually go do the research and actually come up with the new ideas. So we're we're going to be able to help them and guide them with the process, but they have the responsibility to navigate that ambiguous problem space, and we're there to help them and pick them up when they're you know um, uh, having those moments of doubt. But that is a highly productive way to learn, and then it's a highly productive way to to continue to learn, what, regardless of where you are in your education. Right, to build in those moments of struggle. That struggle is what tells you that you're stretching and you're learning, and that's incredibly helpful. That is so interesting. We had with us last night Eduardo Briseño, who I think you said was your classmate, Sarah, and he was talking about the difference between the learning zone and the performance zone. And if we can convince our kids and ourselves that that learning zone is just as important as the performance zone, right? That's exactly right. All right, so now we're going to dive into some questions from the audience. So Great questions coming in. Keep it up, everybody. These are terrific. This um, attendee asks or says, our educational system has been based for years on students getting the correct answer. Yet being creative and persistent with addressing problems is what the world needs and it's much more fulfilling. How do we shift this? If you could answer this, Sarah, this would be the million dollar question. How do we shift the education system so we aren't stuck in the answer mindset from a young age that's hard to overcome. Yeah, I mean, I was sort of like leaning in emotionally as you were. I was hoping that this person like already has some ideas um, because like this, this is the challenge we all yeah. need to be part of working on. And I think that, you know, at, at the D school, we we run into this too, right? We, we you know, even, even though we have, you know, sort of, um, like demonstrated how valuable this way of working is and this way of thinking, it is a huge culture shift in schools, in companies, in all kinds of organizations. And so my hunch, my, my best advice about this is that you have to see it to really understand it and, and to believe it. And so working within a context where you can start to carve out like Let's have one class. Let's have one after school club. Let's have one dedicated space that could support and foster this kind of thinking and then be able to essentially to treat that as a prototype and be able to learn from it and be able to shine a light on it. That's often how these things get going. And, you know, there's a there's a theory, you know, around organizational change that basically says, like, work, go work with the early adopters first. Right. Like you will always have folks who are going to be slower to adopt change to, to you know, come along with new ideas, work with those early adopters, then works with the folks who are kind of like already kind of open to being convinced. And you know what, there will be some skeptics and that, that we might have some, you know, like have to wait that out right until retirement, I'm thinking about in, a, in an academic context, retirements, you know, sort of some generational change. But many folks, especially in this moment, I think are really looking at our current context and realizing like, we need to be teaching the skills that are gonna allow our kids to thrive in this extremely dynamic, extremely fast changing time. Boy, is that ever true. When I worked in school districts, I used to say, you know, we are a lot like an elephant. We're big, but we move really slow. And that's, that's just kind of the nature of the beast, right? And with very long memories, right? So it's very, it's, it can be very challenging. You know, I'll, I'll just share one um, uh, assignment from the book that is, is directly related to this. Um, so like oftentimes when you're trying something new, you hear pushback, which is like, oh, we've tried that already and it didn't work, right? Yeah. Or the other, the other terrible one is like, that would never work here, right? It's like, well, based on what, right? probably based on culture and, and the history and the habits, but also like a lot of assumptions. So we have a practice um, uh, that we use called shadow a student. Um, and that really means that like a teacher or an administrator or even a parent would follow a student from, you know, like bus stop to, to you know, pick up to drop off, um, really walk in their shoes, really understand the ecosystem from their lens. Um, and that can start to help break down some of those like defenses because 
people will see new things, right? Like you will observe challenges or situations or opportunities that you just didn't know was there. And that, that sort of like, um, that absence of that new data, seeing that situation through fresh eyes is, is part of what gets people. And then the organization, you know, people like organizations are people, right? Collections of people, it, it, it gets us all into this more calcified place. So if you can get some new opportunity to observe and to see like, sometimes that can help you break down some of that resistance a little bit. That is so interesting. That's literally what Denise Pope Stanford lecture did when she founded Challenge Success. She spent months literally being a high school student and following five kids and finding out that trying to go to seven classes a day and do homework and sports was impossible, right? Yeah, I mean, that's one of the first things that we often hear from educators to do this is like, it was so uncomfortable to sit all day. Yeah. Right. Like it was physically tiring to be so immobile and like just that little insight can like completely change. And, and it's of course, we can all get that intellectually, but yourself, your physical being going through that experience and being in the moment and feeling those minutes tick by like it's really a visceral experience of a system. And I think one of the challenges with, with education, with healthcare, with lots of the big systems that we have is they are like, we, we look at them on paper and we try to understand them and we try to improve them and make new policies and, and change the rules, but we also have to feel them. And so the practice of shadowing, it gives you that, um, that sense of like urgency. It gives you that new data that you really can feel and identify with. And there are a few other practices in the book. Immersion for Insight is another great one that really are about how do you feel and understand a system in a more visceral way that can help propel the way in which you're calling for change. I love that. Plus, I love the neighborhood walk idea. That was so fascinating. All right, Sarah, how would one apply the design process to family or home life? Yes, well, I, give, I do give a couple of examples in the book um, that are more based on uh, the home context. Um, you know, you could think about um, really uh, any experience that you're creating for your family as an opportunity for design. Um, and you can certainly think about, um, you know, getting every member of the family involved. Um, so if you think about like, how would you think about your next uh, vacation? Or how would you think about, um, you know, designing a really amazing celebration for your grandmother? Um, you can Think about like, what's the experience that you want to design? You could think about using these practices around interviewing or shadowing or observing. Um, you can think about really creatively coming up with like, how many different ideas can we, can we arrive at? Um, and so there's, there's like, there's no limits in terms of where you can uh, apply this. Um, and then I think just in terms of like working with kids in particular, there are lots of these exercises that are, that are about learning empathy and learning how to see things through somebody else's eyes um, or not being too precious about your ideas and trying to get the answer right all of the time. So there, there are a lot of these that could easily be adapted uh, for multiple purposes uh, in, your, in your home and in your family. But I think also, like you mentioned at the beginning of your talk, that finding the, sol finding the problem is as important as finding a solution. Yeah, I heard a good example about um, thinking about like uh, one family was trying to figure out like, why are we always so rushed in the morning? And what they realized actually was that it had to do with behaviors that were happening the evening before. So they could have like tried to fine tune the morning schedule and reorganize the chore chart and all of that. But actually by laying everything out the evening before and making that a family ritual, they were finding that like the morning was way, way simpler. But it took that kind of expansive thinking and that willingness to reframe. They started thinking it was morning, but actually it was the evening before. And when you brought in that, that space for, for sort of like, where might, the, where might the problem really be? That's often when you find the most powerful solutions. That is a really great example. I love that. Families, we can do this. All right. Ingrid asks, is there a creative solution to dealing with the great uncertainty we're living with during this pandemic with its myriad impacts? Well, I would say there is not a one single creative solution. And I think, you know, what my work has shown me is that, um, you know, it is imperative that we unlock this kind of creative behavior from everyone, right? It's like, 
this was a great example, sadly, of um, a situation in which like we couldn't just ask our public leaders to to you know deal with the situation, although we needed that too. But we also had to like band together, you know, in pods in our in our you know like like in our neighborhoods, um, within our schools in new ways. And so actually really having, you know, more um, ability to, to say like, okay, the conditions have changed. What are the three new things that we're going to try and how are we going to learn from them, right? Rather than being stuck on the like, there's, there's just, there's one solution. There's, if only someone could just tell us the right way to reopen our school or the right way to do such and such. So I, I'm just, uh, you know, as you can tell, I'm a huge believer that like that, you know, in, in essentially democratizing design as a practice that many, many people can use and can benefit from. All right, speaking of solving problems, how about this one, Sarah? <laughs> Have you spoken to the Stanford admission folks about ways to redesign admissions to encourage high school students not just to jump through structured hoops? What a wonderful question. I, the, the, the one, one of, it, recently I got the question of like, could you, could you redesign um, bipartisanship? <laughs> Which I was like, sure, no problem. I'll just, I'll take care of that. I would love to. Um, so the admissions question is really interesting. Um, I, I can't say that I've, uh, you know, worked directly with the Stanford admissions folks, but um, we did a project a few years ago uh, that we called Stanford 2025, where we really explored, um, and actually I should say we did that about 10 years ago. So at the time, the year 2025 was like so far in the future. Now, of course, it's right around the corner. Um, but the, but the, the purpose of that was really to think about, you know, what do we need to learn from the ways that our students are today that suggest what an undergraduate education should look like in the future. And that really um, was extremely eye-opening and it provoked a lot of really interesting ideas. And one of the, you know, sort of more playful ideas that came out was the idea of like, what could you do on the admission side to help alleviate that, you know, that behavior, you know, could you, would you ever do something where, you know, students were being, you couldn't apply, right? Like people were being recruited because they had done really interesting and unusual work as, you know, as teenagers. Um, how could you look at that through an equity lens? Could you, could you really think differently about access? Um, and I'll also say that, you know, I think, you know, one of the things that is exciting to me within higher ed is like, we are starting to see more and different pathways. So I hope that it, that there are increasingly, um, you know, sort of like pluralistic ways that we think about what does education look like? It absolutely is going to continue to evolve and change as the needs for it really stretch and grow as our lifespans increase, as our needs for reskilling and professional development frequently throughout our lives. So I think we're at an interesting time where, you know, many parts of the kind of traditional higher education model actually deserve to really be scrutinized and perhaps really um, uh, innovated. Yes, you know, our own little private joke here at the Parent Venture is that it shouldn't have taken a pandemic for educators to realize that parents matter, for example, right? That's one of the things that we hope will continue moving forward that we really do know about our kids and how they learn. Yes, you're here. All right, here's a wonderful question. Can Sarah help us understand the bridges between creativity, resilience, and courage? Hmm, I love this question. Um, I would say I am not a, a, like a research scholar on resilience or courage. Um, but I see the ways in which they're linked just in my in my teaching experience within the D school. Um, so, you know, for one thing, and this kind of addresses a little bit the, the conversation about, you know, sort of um, the, you know, jumping through hoops and wanting the right answer is, is that I have had many situations with students where they they started out a project and they were really playing it safe. And when you start to, under, so it's like, you could see a, a team have the most extraordinary brainstorming session and come up with the most interesting ideas. And the one that they choose is like the most conventional one. And part of that could be because they're sort of like, they haven't been out in the world. And so they kind of don't know like what else is out there. Part of it could be that it's like the thing that they know how to build. <laughs> but part of it is like, they're thinking, what is the thing that's tractable that can get me to the end of this class and like make sure that I get through. And we do a lot of work to try to 
help students be more excited about like the risk taking and the more adventurous outcomes that might fail spectacularly, mm -hmm. um, but will actually help us like explore a much richer solution space. And I think that that is, I mean, that is a form of courage. Like we are asking students, it sounds so simple, but we're asking students to, to really act, you know, in a way that is counter to the ways that many of them have been taught and trained. Um, and, and, you know, they're, they're, you know, sort of very understandable concerns about grades and success and, and all of that. So we, we have set up a classroom environment in which we are really trying to de-emphasize those things that can get in the way of building towards that more resilient and adventurous and courageous um, creative mindset. That's right. It's like Eduardo Brissani was talking about last night. Um, Cirque de Soleil looks perfect, but only because they set up so much time to fail and learn, right? That's right. That's and even right. then they still drop balls during the performance, which I always kind of love. I've, I've also heard, um, we actually had a group of students who, who did some research uh, with Cirque du Soleil once, and at, at least at that time, they did something very interesting around cross-training. So you could have, be, have like the world's best aerialist, and you were still learning skills around salsa dancing. Because what happens when you're like a peak performing athlete is like you have to keep finding new ways to challenge your muscles and to challenge your body and to develop your skills. And so there was this really interesting metaphor for me about like the ways in which it benefits you to keep learning in sort of like orthogonal ways and not necessarily only you know stick to one specialty and that's another thing that I wish for my students is that they're they're really taking advantage of like the full breadth of what they could be learning and exploring for for many many different reasons and that is a whole nother topic of conversation isn't it so Sarah you have done such a great job here um and everybody is so busy. What are your best tips for staying inspired and curious? Um, well, I really could not recommend a derive every so often um, enough. It is it is really nourishing in terms of like that that ability to slow down to look at something carefully. And I think you know a lot of times like when we are tired, when we are stretched too thin, and then we're asked to like be creative what can get in the way is you're like, oh, if I'm creative right now, I'm gonna have to do, I'm gonna have to live with the results of my creativity. I'm gonna have to do that new project, right? So like really like grappling with that, that feeling, you have to find ways to get, to have some kind of external inspiration, right? If you're only sort of like, just trying to come up with something internally all the time, you really get depleted. So the derive is one of those. Um, there are a couple of other practices in the book that are that are similar in terms of like taking time to slow down. Um, one that I'll leave you with is called the micro mindfulness exercises, which you can fit in no matter how busy you are, you can fit into your day because it has to do with like when you pass through a doorway, being mindful of that transition. It has to do with leaving your phone in your pocket when you're waiting in line for a whole day. And just having the, that little expansive space that allows your brain to wander, allows you to see things in a new way, and is just incredibly refreshing. So those are my those are my suggestions. That's really lovely, Sarah. And as a final question, I might be able to guess what you're going to say, but I want to hear it. What gives you hope in this very uncertain time? Um, I'll say two things. One is my students, for sure. You know, they're just so. Um, full of uh, commitment and enthusiasm and frustration and anger and hope and, um, and just really interesting creative ideas and passions. Um, and then I'll also say, you know, I personally, and you reference this in my bio, I, I spend a lot of time taking inspiration from the natural world. And I think um, there was a wonderful piece in the New York Times a few weeks ago about uh, awe walks, A-W-E, and how, how actually like being in the presence of something that is that that creates that feeling of wonder and awe is really good from a mental health perspective. So the ocean, the forest, anything bigger than humans, I, I really get a lot of inspiration from personally. And I think the 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 resilience of some of those ecosystems is also is very inspiring and gives me hope, even though we we have to do so much more to take care of them. Well, thank you so much, Sarah. I did Google your name and you folks online, you can find some of her amazing photographs 
very easily. Sarah, it has been an honor and a privilege to have you with us tonight. Everybody, again, I highly recommend her new book, Creative Acts for Curious People. We are all creative and we were all curious. And I think you really helped us understand that today. So again, thank you so much, Sarah. We were delighted to have you with us and um, look forward to learning more about you and the book and hopefully welcoming authors from the other books that are coming along. We want to thank everybody who was with us today and our sponsors, Mills Peninsula Hospital Foundation and the San Mateo County Office of Education. Take care, everybody, and we hope to see you again soon. Good night.